Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and especially thank you to the speakers for joining us as well, and also the student volunteers who are helping out in the background with a lot of things. Um, as Rachel's already put in the chat, um, good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and yeah, if, if you would like to post in the chat just to say hello, where you're from, if it's morning, if you're having lunch, if you're having your tea, your dinner, um, let us know. Um, and welcome to the session. This is a full paper session um, called Feeling the Edges of Boundaries. Um, I'll be your chair, I'm Angelica, and we've got three really exciting papers um, in the session today. Um, one called Choreographic Infrastructuring for D Design Things, another one about prototyping and prototype use, and then another one about stitching participation in a touch-oriented participatory design practice. Um, so I think really, really exciting things. Um, and if you could go to the next, thank you very much. Um, I'm joining you from Gateshead, which is really close to Newcastle in England, in the Northeast. Um, and this region of England, I'm an, I'm an immigrant here, um, moving kind of from Central and, and Eastern Europe. Um, but the region has a very conflicted history um, related particularly to colonialism and environmental destruction, um, kind of powered by the Industrial Revolution. Um, it was in the Northeast that kind of railways became really big and the coal that was mined in the region um, fired a lot of engines of the empire. Um, and also the ships um, that were used to transport all of that coal were oftentimes built in the Northeast, um, which also saw a huge kind of wave, uh, a huge influx of immigration to the region as well. And I thought I'd have a bit of a look into this, um, looking at kind of two people in particular, and then a, a nice kind of positive way to end as well with the acknowledgements. Um, so first, in the city center of Newcastle, really, really a central point is a statue of Charles Gray, um, who was first a foreign minister and then also a prime minister of, Eng of, of England. Um, and he abolished the slave trade in 1807 as foreign secretary and as prime minister also abolished slavery in the colonies. But at the same time, he also um, paid reparations to the white slave owners um, following the abolition of the slave trade um, that happened during his own government as well. Um, and the, the second person I wanted to look at was William Armstrong, who was also a really prominent figure uh, in the city and in the region, um, who was a weapons dealer um, to lots of different countries, but also primarily, and he saw himself primarily as an engineer. Um, but where am I going? Here. Um, but yeah, he... So he didn't really see himself um, necessarily as responsible um, for the use of the things and weapons he manufactured. Um, and his kind of um, input into all of that um, kind of trade and shipbuilding was also really important in the region and its history um, and led to quite a bit of infrastructural change in the city as well, that one of the seven bridges that are that kind of connect Gateshead and Newcastle across the big river um, was the swing, it's called the Swing Bridge, um, and that was built to allow um, gunships to be moved from the yard in Elswick where they were built down the river to the, to the ocean as well. Um, really interestingly though, and I, I wasn't super aware of, of the last bit I want to share, was just that um, there was also quite a lot of anti-slavery campaigning going on in the city by, by the people who lived in the city. Um, including kind of women abolitionists who financially secured Frederick Douglass's freedom, um, even though during Charles Gray's kind of reign as prime minister, he introduced the a, a, a reform act around voting, um, which was quite good for a lot of men, um, but also obviously only rich and white men. Um, but it was also actually the first time, um, as I read very quickly today, um, that it was the first time in the, in the country that it actually declared voters as men or voters as, as male people. Um, so for the first time actually enshrining that women were no longer allowed to vote. Um, so yes, so Newcastle and the region has a really, really conflicted history in relation to coloniality and environmental destruction with that 
coal mining that has been really important um, for the industry and the region, but obviously has also had these really detrimental effects um, globally. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there um, with that conflicted history. Um, and if we could move to the to guidelines for being together, which I'm sure many of you are very aware of by now, um, but just a reminder to, to remain kind and mindful of differences. Um, and also please be patient with our, our technical hiccups if there are any during the session. Um, please enter the space to listen and to participate with respect. We've got the chat, we've got the Q&A section. Please put your questions in there throughout the session. Um, and please, um, if you haven't done so yet, mute your microphone to avoid any interruption of the presentations. Um, please be careful in your choice of words and endeavor to make your expressions and language more inclusive. Um, and don't judge or trivialize um, others. And of course, you know, phrase your critique, um, but in a respectful and constructive way. Um, and as part of that, please avoid any generalizations um, and anchor your perspectives in direct experience or personal observation. Um, as you might have heard at the beginning, we are recording the session. Um, and if you want to remain anonymous, please turn your cameras off um, and de-identify yourself on Zoom if you'd like your question or comments not to be in that recording either. Um, and just uh, an invitation to the speakers in particular um, and to everyone also in the chat, as you've already started doing, um, kind of pointing out where you're joining us from, um, please do also acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land and some of the histories um, that might be very conflicted. Um, as I've tried to do in, in my opening. And with that, um, I'll pass on right to Flavia Devonas Hoffman and Christina Hoek Carlson um, with the first paper presentation on choreographic infrastructure for design things, a new method for participatory design in teacher education. Hello, my name is Flavia de Wunas Hoffmann. And my name is Christine Hörg Carlsen. We have written the paper Choreographic Infrastructuring for Design Things, where we present and discuss a new method that we have developed for participatory design in teacher education. It is a multimodal method based on choreographic principles and a specific pattern. Therefore, we call this method Choreo Pattern. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I stand today, the Inuit people of Kalashlit Nunat, and I pay my respect to the elders past and present. Our presentation oscillates between empirical and theoretical explanations. First, we are going to describe the components and procedures of choreo pattern, and then we outline how, in our view, choreo pattern aligns the participants in a design thing and we connect that alignment with three kinds of motions and three kinds of enactments. Finally, we present some reflections in regard to the prevalence of choreo pattern in case you would like to use the method in your project. The research we present here is part of an ongoing project named Participate. This project is funded by the Research Council of Norway and aims to develop new methods for teacher education to give student teachers the skills and experience they need to participate as equal partners in cross-sectorial collaborations in Norwegian schools. Such collaborations have become quite common in the Norwegian educational sector, whereas the culture school bag is the most prominent example, spanning literature, music, visual arts, performing arts, films and culture heritage. Based on the core principles of participatory design, our research aimed to develop a new participatory design method for infrastructuring the genuine participation in the design of a course within teacher education. A design group met frequently in 2021 to develop the course and in this presentation, we focus on the first workshop where Kuyo Pattern was implemented. A total of eight participants joined this workshop physically, including school teachers, teacher educators, student teacher, and professional dance educators. 
For those of you who read the paper, you might remember the illustration of the structure and activities of choreo pattern. The method was applied in a participatory design making workshop to align the stakeholders to participate in design of the course. In the following, as an illustration, a yarn is used throughout the presentation, capturing the threefold alignment conditioned by this method. Choreo pattern is a method that aims at infrastructuring a flat knotwork structure for ideation. Choreo pattern consists of two main elements, station work and movement transitions between the stations. First, we will address the station work. In the station work illustrated by NOPS, the participants engage with specific questions related to the content, structure and methods of the course to be designed. The questions and the provided material are listed in Table 1 in the article. The station work is multimodal. This means that the participants are asked to externalize their thoughts and discussions through aesthetic expressions and extensions of the verbal language. In the article, we have given an example from the station where watercolors were provided. The participants were discussing what it is that motivates the students to actively participate in the course. Several paintings illustrate a dynamic in forms of circles and spirals, an energy that is necessary between the students so that the encounter leads to an engaged collaboration. Now we give you another example and show how ideas and thoughts are expressed and externalized through clay. Here, the participants are discussing how the students can profit from each other's fields of expertise. In the upper left picture, you see a lilac and brown strand indicating the epistemic background of the students and how they merge in the course. The white clay stands for the common ground that motivates the students to collaborate, which are the pupils. A green clay surrounds the setting, indicating a safe space that the course should provide. The yellow and blue strands indicate features and concepts that the students share, such as dramaturgy, composition, impulse, body and space. The aim of the station work is to generate ideas, to support ideation through multimodal engagement and to provide a flat structure as there is no defined authorship at the stations. Also, the stations are not together in a flat, flat structure meaning that they are equally relevant and important. Every entry point and every order in the sequence of stations is possible. As an effect, the participants are visiting the station in individual tours and the constellation of participants differed at every encounter. The tie between the knots are the movement transitions. After having spent 15 minutes at a station, the participants were asked to walk during two minutes along the paths on the floor, illustrated by the long threads between the knobs. If they meet other participants coming towards them, they were to stop, take some postures, mirror the other and continue walking. In short, we will show a little video from this walk. And as you will see, the movements do not have to be very complicated. But the participants have to be attentive and reactive. If they meet a participant walking in the same direction, they are to stop and try to travel synchronously side by side with each other. The participants were asked to not talk during the movement transitions. And here is the example from the workshop. We can see two of the participants coming together. We can also see one making a suggestion which the other one accepts and mirrors. And now, notice the small details of the hand before they move apart. In the beginning, the participants were rather hesitant and moved within their own comfort zone. But as choreo pattern progressed, they became more experimental and used more complex movements with increased speed and dynamics. The aim of the movement transitions is to clear the mind from the previous stations, to enhance ideation through a small break with kinesthetic engagement, and to have intersubjective embodied encounters 
with the participants. Choreo pattern has a rather strict structure and it's important to include a warm up session at, uh, of at least 50 minutes before you start, just to get comfortable with moving together. With five stations, the ideation part of Choreo pattern takes about one and a half hour and the concretization part where all participants are visiting the results of the station work takes another one to one and a half hour. Thereby, a full session will take around four hours. Choreo pattern is infrastructure for design things. But Choreo pattern is not a fixed infrastructure, but it's performed into existence by the participants, which through their participation are infrastructuring the design thing. Theoretically, we have contributed with an extended notion of alignment in design things that is based on threefold motions. Our empirical analysis showed that the participants are performing three enactments, enactment of engagement, of agency and of knowledge. We suggest that these three enactments are supported by the three alignments that Choreo pattern is infrastructuring for, and we will now provide a linkage between the three enactments, the three motions and the three alignments. Choreo pattern is based on choreographic thinking. However, it is not a dance based method. There is no focus on the quality of movement, but to be mindful, aware and open towards the own and the other participants bodies, motions and movements. And here our notion of choreography is put into effect. We understand choreography as a practice in which motions and participation in these motions are organized relative to uh, other participants and their motions. First, the enactment of engagement concerns the ways in which participants interact and cooperate in choreo pattern due to their embodied being in the world. It involves both the bodily and emotional engagement in a process in which the participants explore new ideas concerning the teacher education course. Choreo pattern provides the possibility condition for enactment of engagement through locomotion in time and space. Choreo pattern thus aligns the collective of humans and non-humans through infrastructuring for spatial arrangement. Enactment of knowledge concerns the expression and sharing of knowledge, for example, explanation, mutual learning, meaning making and the process of sharing ideas using movements, words and or material in the making of the outputs. Choreo pattern provides the possibility condition for enactment of knowledge through motions of thoughts. Thus, the participants are aligned through infrastructuring for attention, which is the directedness of thought towards the matter of concern. Third is the enactment of agency, which relates to the participants' impact and influence in creating choices regarding the course design, indicating ways in which the participants' voices play out in their interaction with each other and the material at hand. Choreo pattern provides the possibility condition for enactment of agency through motions of feelings. Choreo pattern does aligns the participants around a matter of concern through infrastructuring for attunement. In short, Choreo pattern infrastructures for threefold alignment in design things, alignments of bodies, arrangement, Alignments of thoughts, attention. Alignments of feelings, attunement. Choreo pattern is infrastructuring for alignment in design things. In our study, we have theoretically provided an extended understanding of alignment in design things and have empirically shown how these alignments can be infrastructured for. However, it is important to point out that choreo pattern did not work equally well for all participants. If you are interested in the participants' voices on Choreo pattern, we recommend reading the extensive analysis in our article. We have also empirically shown how it's possible to implement participatory design in teacher education and more specifically to use participatory design for designing a course in teacher education. We see great potential in connecting participatory design and teacher education or education in general because it provides tools and techniques for development of teacher education programs, 
where teacher educators from varied disciplines come together and collaborate. Further, it provides a method for including external partners in curriculum design to share knowledge and strengthen the collaboration between varied stakeholders within and outside teacher education in order to make teacher education, uh, teacher education matter for school and for other relevant sectors. We believe that it is possible to implement choreo pattern in a range of contexts, not only teacher education, but also healthcare, architecture, art curation, event production, city planning, and many more. The strength lies in the pattern for how to generate ideas. Make sure to set aside enough time for ideation and, con and concretization, and make sure that the participants feel comfortable moving with each other. In future research, it would be interesting to use and evaluate choreo pattern in other arenas. One possibility is, for example, in architectural design process to give citizens with their tacit knowledge a possibility to contribute and have an impact on their future environment. We are excited to see how choreo pattern evolves in the future and we invite you into our community. Please contact us if you are interested and let us know what your experiences are with choreo pattern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a lovely video. Um, yes, congratulations. <laughs> I don't know if we can, at least the people who are in the room have a quick round of applause. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that pattern. I, I don't see any clarifying questions in the chat. Um, I might give it a minute and blabber on for a bit um, to give some listeners a bit of time to see if they have a quick question. Um, I had a really quick clarifying question and you kind of answered it at the end when you said, you know, come join us, this is useful in other settings as well. Um, but this idea of a pattern um, kind of coming at it from like almost like sewing patterns and, and that kind of thing, they're quite directive in some ways, but also allow for a little bit of interpretation, pattern tweaking, you know, to make a garment fit properly um, to the specific body that you're making it for. I was just wondering if you also invite that in choreo pattern. Uh, if I can answer for us, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we are thinking also of how can we further develop choreo pattern so that it is not that strict, but, but uh, a good thing to have it strict is that it keeps the focus very tuned during the whole session because it is very energy consuming and you can easily go from one to 100 and to 1000 without getting really on the point what you're actually discussing. And um, in other content, in other, um, yeah, well, in other, in other settings, it would be suitable to adapt the pattern for sure but this it, it would require some considerations how to make it fit no thank you so much um i totally agree um considerations are always always needed but thank you so much for sharing a little bit more um and i think we'll go on to the next paper and i think we'll have quite a lot of time at the end in this session for some discussion across all the papers so if you're if you're watching um please do put your kind of also bigger questions um into the chat as well as the session progresses um so the second paper we have in the session um is called prototyping and prototype use in participatory design with older adults a systematic literature review and we've got harald matman mu here um in the video and also here to answer questions at the end. Um, so thank you to whoever's putting the screen up. Um, Hi, I'm Haral Murtmanbu and I'll be presenting our paper Prototyping and Prototype Use in Participatory Design with Older Adults, a Systematic Literature Review, which I wrote with my colleague Suas Kovin Yoshi. This systematic literature review aims to build our understanding of how participatory design practitioners are using prototyping 
and prototypes with older adults. Through this understanding, we can develop our methods in prototyping and prototype use and better involve older adults in participatory design. We focus on prototyping and prototypes because historically the use of prototypes has played a central role in bridging various activities of participatory design processes, yet their intention, application and understanding varies widely. This paper concerns both prototyping as an activity and the use of prototypes as concrete manifestations. In this study, we use quite open definitions of prototyping and prototypes to include diverse perspectives and avoid narrowing our search down to fit our preconceptions. We view prototypes as any representation of a design idea, regardless of medium. And we view prototyping as designing and building prototypes. We sought to answer the research questions how are prototypes and prototyping used in participatory design with older adults? What forms of prototype use and prototyping are used in participatory design with older adults? Who participates in these forms of use? How are these forms combined? To build this understanding, we did a systematic literature review. The desired data for this review was the set of participatory design work that includes older adults as participants and mentions prototyping or prototypes. This translates to three elements, participatory design, older adults, and prototyping or prototype use. Uh, we implemented the search in this manner and this yielded 76 studies. Through text analysis, we formed 10 categories to describe the various prototyping and prototype use in the primary data. These categories are purely descriptive and they are refine, evaluate, motivate, generate, explore, teach, decide, communicate, understand, and contribute. The categories relate and overlap, yet they maintain distinct intentions and effects of prototyping and prototype use in these 76 studies. I find these categories themselves helpful for understanding prototype and prototype use, but we wanted to better understand the prevalence and relation between these categories. To explore this, we use the categories to categorize each study's use of prototyping and prototype use. Uh, this table includes all 76 studies and is very difficult to read in this presentation, so I'll zoom in very soon but the table is still meant to give a visual impression of the prototyping and prototype use. The cells colored in green indicate that prototype use involved older adults. Those in yellow indicate that researchers were involved and blue indicates both. We can see from here that evaluate the second category has a lot of green cells, which indicates that older adults were commonly involved in prototype activities that meant to evaluate. We can zoom in a bit on a few lines. Here in the third row, we can see that Lindsay and colleagues use prototyping and prototypes to explore with older adults. With this data, we can easily apply some statistical methods to help us understand the patterns and prevalence of each category of use. In this overview, we can see that the most common form of prototyping and prototype use with older adults in the primary data was evaluation. 67% of the studies included older adults in this way. More than half of the studies also used prototypes and prototyping to understand. The least common form was used to motivate. Only 7% of studies and only all older adults use prototypes or prototyping to motivate. We can also look at how these categories are combined. This table shows a correlation matrix for the occurrences of prototyping and prototype use in these studies. Uh, the data is mirrored in this table, so you only need to look at one side of the black line of cells. Examining how categories of prototyping and prototype use are combined sheds light on potential overlapping and connected categories, as well as forms of prototyping and prototype use that are combined or belong 
within the same traditions. The strongest positive correlations were between explore and generate, explore and teach, and motivate and teach. There were fewer negative strong correlations, the strongest two being one, communicate and evaluate, and two, teach and refine. These correlations are interesting, but we can also use a method called principal component analysis to explore patterns between more than two categories at a time. This statistical method can suggest a more concise set of categories that aims to maintain the original set of categories ability to describe the data, essentially looking for underlying factors. The principal component analysis produced three components that could account for 50% of the variation in the data set. The strongest component consisted of motivate, generate, explore, teach, a bit of communicate and understand, and the absence of contribute. This indicates that these categories together may form an underlying factor that describe prototyping and prototype use in the primary data. There is also a third component with a strong connection between refine and evaluate, as well as the absence of communicate. The three components produced by the principal component analysis may suggest three different practices of prototype and prototyping use in participatory design results. On its own, the third component seems to fit better with user-centered design than the focus of participatory design. However, evaluate and refine are immensely helpful in any design process and the inclusion of participants. These forms of inclusion may be less straining for participants and may therefore be widely used. This would be a considerate explanation. Still, participation through evaluation and refine limits the power and potential contributions of participants. These three traditions may also be three different natural types of studies to publish or perform. Documenting and publishing the entirety of design processes may be too comprehensive and may not fit well with a focused and concise scientific contribution. Prototyping and prototype use vary greatly within participatory design model results. The intentions, effects and manner of inclusion needs to be clearly defined and described. We urge participatory design practitioners to explicitly answer three questions when describing the involvement of all adults in participatory design. Who is included in each prototyping and prototype activity? How are they included in these activities? Why are they involved? This systematic literature review examined the role of the use of prototypes and prototyping in participatory design with older adults. We analyzed 76 studies and created 10 descriptive forms of use of prototype and prototyping to characterize its use in participatory design with older adults. Our analysis further examines the prevalence of each category of forms of use as well as who participates within these forms of activities. The analysis in this review showed that older adults were more commonly involved in prototyping and prototype use by evaluating and refining more often than decide, teach, explore, and generate, which relate more to the central principles and goals in participatory design. The principal component analysis further highlighted three somewhat separate practices within prototyping and prototype use. These three clusters may be a natural grouping corresponding to three subtle types of study design, or they may reflect three different traditions or views on prototyping and prototype use within participatory design with older adults. The third cluster has many similarities to user-centered design and less so to participatory design. Yet these forms of prototyping and prototype use are vital in participatory design as well. Fabulous, thank you. Again, if we can have a, for those who are on the screen at least, a little applause. Um, thank you so much, Harald, for, for the video and, and for the work as well. It's really, really interesting. Um, very different to the first paper, but also I think methodolo methodologically um, a really interesting way to look at PD. Um, and I'll, I'll babble on for a bit to give people who are watching a chance to ask any clarifying questions. Um, and as I do that, oh, this possibly. Yes, there is a clarifying question. Um, 
from Joyce in the Q&A. Why was the research team interested in how prototyping is used in PD with older adults? I.e., what were the team's initial assumptions? And how did you define older adults in your review? Thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, we've already received some comments about um, defining older adults, and we decided to go pretty broad and aim for an overview uh, rather than a very specific age range, since it's an uh, incredibly heterogeneous uh, group, uh, no matter what age range you go for. Um, but we still found it helpful to limit the search to this term or, yeah. And why the interest in prototyping? Um, well, I find prototyping a uh, fun thing to do, and it seems like people use it really differently. And uh i wanted to guide my further work uh towards uh something more interesting and helpful to the um, field of participatory design with older adults and uh, i suspected that maybe prototypes um was being used differently with older adults than other groups and i felt like this should be investigated uh to better assess how we involve older adults in design uh, i hope that answered a bit but feel free free to add more if yeah you have any more thoughts thanks Harvard. and and joyce also said in the chat thank you um so i think that that did answer the question um are there any other questions that are kind of clarifying yeah, can I do a question? Yeah, please. Okay, uh, I was wondering if uh, in future research you, you are considering expanding your research questions uh, to look at which are the particularities of prototyping with older adults uh, in these forms of use, for example, the ones that you said are not so popular, for example, decide, teach, and explore? Yeah. yeah. Uh, another good question, and that's exactly what I'm hoping to do. Uh, I specifically decide. I found very interesting, and I would have expected more uh, clearly stated uh, or studies that clearly stated that now we're applying prototyping or prototypes in order to help the participants uh, make design decisions. Um, but that wasn't as easy to find in these studies. So I'm hoping to work with that and include some aspects of collaborations over longer periods of time in my work moving forwards. Brilliant. Thank you, Howard. And I hope that answered your question, Anna. And it, it kind of also answered the, the other question in the Q&A, which was about kind of surprising results. Um, but I'll leave that question there, Vincenzo, if that's okay for a minute, and I'll come back to that, because I think that's maybe an interesting one for everyone to answer as well at the end. Um, so thank you very much, Harald. Um, and we'll go on to the, the third and final paper of the session. Um, and this is a paper called Stitching Participations in a Touch-Oriented Participatory Design Practice. Um, and we've got Anna Maria um, Ooh, what's your last? The names have all disappeared. There, Anna Maria Cop Copecci um, here to answer questions after the video as well. Sorry about that. Your name disappeared for a second. Um, so yeah, thank you very much um, for putting the video up. And off we go. Hello, my name is Anna Maria Copecci Macayan and I'm happy to present our paper, Stitching Participations in a Touch-Oriented Participatory Design Practice at this year's Participatory Design Conference. The paper was written together with Professor Guilherme Correa Meyer from Unicinos. In this paper, our interest was to discuss that, despite the importance of participatory design literature concerned with democracy as a process of engaging through what arises from or in response to problems experience in the situation, 
we identify the need to design alternative ontologies and relational modes, which enables us to listen to other urgencies. In the paper, we propose an experiential mental shift instance by invoking touch and sentient aspects to craft new understandings of participation within a design process. In reading the work of Christina Hook with other authors, we understood that this shift instance is meant to be experiential, felt, and aesthetic, engaging with the realities of our subjectivities, sensations, feelings, emotions, and values. Therefore, the main objective of our paper and our presented practice was to explore other ways of thinking participation by reclaiming a sensorial experience. We invoke touch within a design process guided by the question how we can think about other ways of doing participatory design through touch. We restored especially to the concept of touch proposed by Maria Puigli de la Pela Casa. Likewise, we notice approximations with the concept of sente pensar proposed by the Colombian sociologist Orlando Fausborda and the concept of correspondence proposed by Tim Ingold. We report in our paper on episodes of an experimental prototyping practice carried out through a embroidery group. The explorations of this case led us to nurture the relationship between mind, body and world, introducing the idea of a touch-oriented participatory design, TOPD, when considering participation attentive to various rhythms, making democracy through storytelling and the needs of care. To think about participation through touch, our work draws on perspectives from participatory design and the concept of publics regarding a democratic understanding. In summary, we wanted to emphasize that the interesting thing about this approach is the difference between enabling participation and the constitution of publics, which lies in the preliminary framing of issues and participants, as opposed to a more sensitive, spontaneous and experimental involvement. For us, a participatory approach with an emphasis on a democratic basis becomes a way to raise questions and highlight controversies and dilemmas. It becomes stimulating for design to generate opportunities for participation oriented not by shared visions, but by different voices, pronunciations, discussions and continuous engagement. Through these occasions, points of views can be expressed, invented and constructed or transform it, while those conflicted ones are considered favorable without necessarily being unified. This mode of participation points to a design process that guides forces in keeping spaces open for others, that is, creating an environment conducive to expression. And here we resort to Stenger's concept of cosmopolitics, which implies considering other according to the notion of the idiot. In this sense, for us, participation must be built as a practice of continually questioning certainties and habitual ways of relating to others. For that, we must slow down, to cultivate a distinct sensibility, hesitating to construct a common and detached world. The concept of touch for us is a possibility of establishing these other rhythms. It invites awareness to the embodied character of perception, affect and thinking. It is crucial to think about design process based on touch because it is concerned with producing knowledge from other sensibilities. Touch invites us to be more aware of how to live and how to relate because beyond evoking a specific and forceful sensorial experience, it also has affective charge. It emerges from contact with the world being a process through which body learns, evolves and becomes. Touch can also be a way of proposing to senti pensar, a process of knowing no longer fragmented or disciplinary but interrelated to reality and emotional knowledge. To adopt sentient aspects of design means placing together different ways of perceiving reality, where actions and thoughts are intertwined with emotions, feelings, desires and affections. Similar to this perspective, Ingold introduced that if today our world is in crisis, we have engaged in campaigns of interaction and forgotten how to correspond. For him, to endure the condition of noticed correspondence, we need a relative quietude. In our paper perspective, I slow down. Finally, in the paper we discussed an experimental prototyping practice oriented by touch. We performed this practice in 2020 and organized it in four experimentation cycles, where participants engaged in an activity mediated by embroidery were involved in a dynamic to think together and together with what's being made. In broader in that sense, propose an accessible way of inviting people to discuss life. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we structured activity to online meetings held at Zoom. 
and exchanged a box of embroidery materials between six participants. The cycles were four moments of 15 days each. It started with receiving the materials box instructions, and then the participants were encouraged to create freely. Afterwards, we had an online meeting to talk about what they had created. At the end of each cycle, uh, we randomly exchanged the kits between participants. The test that guided the practice was for participants to imagine and create something that would express their life experience and feeling of isolation under the circumstances they were in. In the paper, we report some episodes of the practice, starting from the moment where each participant unfolded a team based on their unique experience, will see a personal and reflective nature of the practice. One participant, for example, decided to do a timeline with the dates of the pandemic. The dates since she arrived from Montevideo highlighting birthdays and the day her mother left. Other participants preferred to start embroidering from what emerged after touching the material. Unlike the idea of representing, the hand in contact with the materials brought out memories and sensations. The desire to explore the materials characterized an experimental process in which ideas about embroidery arose through making. For another participant, the touch of the material brought out memory of her mother working with Wu. In our description, we cover the forward meetings, where participants received the work from others. During the Zoom meetings, they described their creations from the receipt of the box already touched by someone else. The notion of participation was intertwined with the idea of continuity. A theory in the speech of some participants was the idea of completing a drawing from traces that had been left behind. Continuity was a form of corresponding to other and in imaginative narrative, adding new elements to the collective creation at hand. Touch also suggests getting involved with the situation, characterizing a process where the work was changing every week, not only by the influence of what emerged during the practice, but outside it. For example, one participant portrayed the fires in the Brazilian Pantanal Bayam. The way this embroidery crossed this narrative with the situation represented what she was feeling and mobilized others. In our discussion section, we highlighted some of our learnings from this practice. Extending the idea of touch as participation helps us to think about an experimental process attentive to what is written. By inviting participants to embroidery, touch and gain distance from their daily workloads if it isn't written, we establish an immersive atmosphere during the meetings and individual moments of making. The fact that embroidery has proposed slowing down seems to have created the occasion for a slightly different sensitivity to develop tools for noticing. Strategy as deceleration allowed them to feel, dialogue and access other modes of attention. Our practice seems to also promote a process of making democracy through storytelling, a dynamic in which individual narratives intersect from the participants' relationship with the embroidery. This can be thought of storytelling in the sense of new imaginary events are mixed with narrated facts. Therefore, by emphasizing a dimension of touch and a process of sentimental with the territory, the narratives that manifest themselves because of the embroidery were not representations, but something that was built and constituted from the point of view of each participant, the circumstance of the environment and the correspond to the other. Lastly, with our practice, we were able to embrace an ethos of care. According to Maria Puigli de la Bella Casa, this ethos advances from a predetermined question about how we can care more, to ask how to care and what is caring, for us also, how to touch. The whole level of discussions presented in the practice were only possible because of the ability to establish relationships through touch. Touch was a physical sensation human to material and an affection presented, including during the dialogue. Thus, touch meant embodying care. Materiality was a substitute for the body, as participants sent each other's feelings, hugs and word views through the threads and their tangled composition. To conclude, this paper was dedicated to starting a discussion about ways of doing participatory design, engaged with touch and a sentient design perspective, to favor sensorial and sensible aspects of a design process. 
we understood that touch overlaps the idea of participation. Our proposal of a touch-oriented participatory approach, TOPD, was to create opportunities to integrate emotion and rationality. Designers who wish to adopt such a proposal to establish a practical environment engaged with bodily activities of making together to a slowdown strategy. We invite researchers to engage with other touch-oriented participatory practices as a way of creating new relations between communities and proposing new forms of making and being together by allowing ourselves to be touched and affected by those and everything that surrounds us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, yes. <laughs> thank you, Christina, for always being the first. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I can see in the chat also some applause. And again, a question to the chat, to the, to the listeners. Um, if you have any clarifying questions for Anna, please, please post them now. Um, there's quite a bit of love for the paper in the chat. Um, so please do have a look at that. Um, you, Christina, you have a question. Yes, uh, just a short question. If you can uh, elaborate a little bit on how the participants were recru recruited and what, uh, how you, uh, how you define criteria for, for choosing those. Sure, definitely. Uh, we kind of open a call for artisans in the city. We first we map uh, some of the feminine collectives that we knew that exist in the city. For example, there was one happening in Zoom, there was other one uh, happening in the park. So we send them an open call inviting people to submit their application. And when we receive kind of 20 applications, something like that, uh, we saw the profiles that were different from each other so trying to choose very different person mm -hmm. kind of like that <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> thank you um are there any other clarifying questions for anna from anyone in, in the audience anyone listening if not, I'll say a big thank you to all the speakers. And if we can have another round of applause for everybody um, before we go on to kind of a bigger discussion, we've got quite a bit of time. If I've got my, my timetable incorrect, we've got about 20 minutes. Um, I hope that's right. <laughs> um, and again, if you have any kind of bigger questions across all the papers, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, oh. Uh, we've got another chat, another question from Joyce, actually for you, Anna, um, on how COVID affected your initial plans and what changes you made to ensure that touch was still an important component in your research approach. Yeah, definitely COVID was a surprise. Uh, first, we imagined doing the research uh, on the field and doing a physical practice with participants uh, in table sharing, uh, doing broderies uh, together and broadening together. And then uh, because COVID started before our practice, we could uh, do the changes in time. So we then we decided to do this box that would pass to each participant's house and uh, start challenging ourselves to see touch in other ways. So touch between the participant and the researcher when delivering the box, uh, seeing touch as a physical thing between participants and the materials, but other types of touch, for example, when they send each other's hugs and stuff, and when they, um, they show uh, affections and other things. Uh, when in discourse, for example, so these other types of sensorial and affection, we kind of understand it as touch as well. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, I think, yeah, I can see in your paper how COVID would have a real, <laughs> a real big impact on, on, on your project. So thanks for explaining that. Um, something that 
um, was in the chat that I didn't mention for the first paper as well. It was more of a, a comment than a question um, that the work on the, on the um, what was it called, choreo pattern um, reminded Vincenzo of theater of the oppressed, or he saw a lot of connection with the theater of the oppressed. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to respond to that, um, Flavia and Christina. Mm, I can make a start and Christina, you just add in. <laughs> um, of course, uh, who is it? Vincento, maybe it would be interesting to discuss that because your association somehow, I would be interesting to see how your associations come up. Um, the thing with the theater of the oppressed is to stop uh, a, a play and then discuss what options do we have, which way can we go? And we did not really have that, but what we had in our pattern is that we work upon each other's ideas. So when the first group elaborated um, a suggestion as a solution or as an answer on the question, and then the next group could see that and work further or add to it and, and in some way, this was a discussion, but it was not the discussion on a discursive level, but on the level of material, in a social material engagement. And from this point of view, we are very much in line with Anna Maria's paper, <laughs> where we touch materials and where, where we externalize our thoughts and our ideas. So it's a, a little bit another um, approach, I would say, but. What we have is the embodiment and our very the physical engagement actually in in our method where we move together where we have in intersubjective encounters which we also have in theater. Yeah, um, I think what you manage, Maria, or what I I really liked about uh, your arrangement uh, is that uh, yeah, it's related to the time the time frame of it and the thing of slowing down and and it seems like when everyone got this package and that they actually had time to involve uh, and that's kind of what we have been discussing about Kuro, when we talk about Kuro pattern and and how to develop it because it was kind of a strict time frame and where your participants probably felt that they really got to slow down and and use the body and the mind and yeah elaborate on everyone's ideas uh, what we experienced was that actually time kind of a little bit works against us uh, uh, so that's i got very inspired when i i um, read your paper and also when when you yeah um, when i saw your presentation now and might want to read it once more and see if we can adapt some of the thoughts you actually managed to do uh, in your project. I, I really liked it and it kind of hit me in, the, in my heart. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but I missed the question. Maybe someone has, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the question was, but uh, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we've put it in the chat. Um, it, you're, the, you're the question was that okay. Vin, Vincenzo um, wrote that it was a very interesting work um, and he had a com or they had a comment about um, them seeing a lot of connections with theater yes. of the oppressed from your work. Yes. Um, so I, I think you have answered that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't know, Anna, if you wanted to respond to, to what Christina just said as well, because I, I also see a lot of connections between the two yes. bits of work and my head is also going into yeah. 500 different directions. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. When I, I was reading your work, uh, Flavia and Christine, uh, I saw that you wrote uh, the method was extremely time consuming. And I was... Uh, wondering if the time was wasn't precisely what qualifies the result um, other than trying to make it fast so we can embrace a lot of things and because for me time was very important um, either for for participants to work at home in their own time if they have rush or anything 
but during the sessions, I, I, we appreciate time because it was short, uh, short uh, sessions of one hour, and slowing down was important for them to rationalize and emotionally what they were feeling, and yeah, I don't know um, how can I say that maybe in your research time would be very important, and I think even more movement sessions. I don't know if you uh, already thought about that, uh, doing a post movement session. And for Harold, I I also wondering if one of the reasons why, I don't know, thinking about hypothesis here, of why people don't, I don't know, prototype with older adults for exploration would be time as well. Uh -huh. Just, just before you respond, I see, I see you, Flavia. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to add that um, Vincenzo replied in the Q and A to to you and Christina. Um, absolutely, it would be great to exchange some ideas. I have in mind two techniques that are not necessarily the forum you mentioned. So, I think um, Vincenzo might get in touch, or or if you get in touch with them, um, I'll. I, I'm just conscious that Harvard hasn't said much, so I'll, I'll ask Harvard to just respond to Anna and then I'll come back to you, Christina and Flavia, if that's all right. Um, yeah, it's definitely a very probable explanation to the uh, lack of prototype use for exploration. It is very demanding work to create prot prototypes together with uh, participants and even without, so this is no in no way intended as um, a large critique of the lack of prototyping use, but more just to understand how we use it and if there were some areas that weren't uh, as much explored as they could be, and whether there were multiple uh, competing traditions within these studies. Thank you as well. Um, there is another question for you in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll go to, to Flavia and Christina first to respond to kind of the point Anna made as well. Mm, okay, yeah. Uh, concerning the time, I think we are into what Angelica mentioned, um, that we have to adapt a method to the target group. And in our, in our uh, case, we had teachers collaborating with dancers and teacher educators with dance educators so we had the two very different fields collaborating and these fields or these participants perceived time very differently usually teachers work very fast they have to develop course content and lessons plans in very short amount of times while artists have a lot of time to or they at least they have more time <laughs> to elaborate ideas and and artistic solutions, and this time teachers do not have. So from the point of view of teachers, we have a very restricted time frame to develop a course content. And then for the teachers, it was a lot, it was very time consuming to use four hours to develop one day, <laughs> uh, one day course, whilst for the artists, it was far too short. We should have had more time to develop the course. I don't know, Christina, you want to add? Something? No, no, no. I, I'm glad you emphasized that, and 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 that's true. And uh, and when we participated in the choral pattern, uh, for me as a participant, I I I I, I didn't feel stressed. Uh, on the contrary, it it felt kind of meditative, especially the 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 walking session where you got time to reflect on on the um, um, things you had been working on and and. Yeah, uh, free your mind for the work to come. So, so yeah. Um, but I was thinking about because we also did our project in during COVID time, uh, mm -hmm. but we managed to uh, meet physically and do choreo pattern. Uh, but we also tried choreo pattern online and <laughs> and on Zoom, and and it worked there as well. But uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, not as good. <laughs> it was not developed, especially for for 
Zoom. Uh, but uh, you, Anna Maria, you you developed this project, uh, uh, taking all the restrictions uh, we had in COVID time, and I wonder if that, I wonder how your method would be, would look like or 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 be if it wasn't for COVID, because I think COVID might uh, work. And COVID because of COVID and because everyone was isolated and, and receive all these packages, it kind of um, might have felt more, uh, not exciting, that's not a word, but to feel part of a group when you're isolated and, and maybe your arrangement felt more, had more of an impact because they was is isolated. So I wonder, and also because they had time to work alone, but feel together and, so I wonder if how your arrangement would 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 be experienced if they actually sat in the same room and and worked on more like her pattern because then it would maybe be more alike what we actually did. I don't know if you understood my question, but, but it's <laughs> no, kind yes. of it's I definitely kind of, understood. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Do Do you want to complete? No, sorry. No, I'm finished. <laughs> Okay, uh, I cannot answer your question because I had no idea what no. what would be happen. But definitely, the emotional part of COVID affected the group in different individual ways. Uh, I see that I invited some uh, older adults <laughs> uh, to participate, and for them it was really an important moment during the month and during the week. So we can, they can, they could see people and they could, I don't know, participate in something as you said in a group, and this definitely uh, touch them in a way that because of COVID, and I don't know what other 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 options I would have doing a a physical uh, activity, probably different. I don't know. Yeah, because you have the time. You, you then you had had to have the time limit, but when they sit alone, they. As yes. I understood it, they had no no the whole yeah, the whole way of the um, the activity of continuing other work would be different because they would do together, I don't know, probably the the type of collaboration would be other. Yeah. But thank you. <laughs> yeah, I I love the yeah, love your project. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you very much um to, to all of you for that super, super interesting. And I hope kind of those conversations continue beyond the panel as well. Um, there's another question from Mohamed Adamu to Harald. Um, looking at the literature space you explored, do you think similar descriptive forms of use of prototypes and prototyping might emerge should, um, should the focus be on like other, in other settings like healthcare data, for example? Uh, yeah, it's a interesting question. So thanks for that. Um, I didn't find too many other uh, descriptive works that went about it in the same way, but I found the um, process of using some of these methods to really uh, explore the primary data and analysis very helpful. Um, of course, you get an impression of the prevalence of each category, but and uh, just using these correlations and factor analysis uh, was made it a lot more interesting to me and has helped uh, guide my project. So I really recommend it. And uh, there are plenty of programs that do it for you. So if you do have a set of categories and a lot of studies, uh, definitely try it out. And it would be interesting to see whether uh, these categories or uh, different categories emerge and whether um, the data will look very different for other groups of participants. And I'm not sure whether the focus should be on uh, health care data. Um, uh, I'm not, could you add to that question or? Maybe I misunderstood, or maybe I don't know no, enough about it, but... Um, um, the way I read the question, I don't know if this is right, Mohammed, if, 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 it's, if you meant it differently, um, please say in the chat, but how I read it is just as an example, like mm. as a topic area, 
um, that like you could do an analysis right. of that area like you did with prototyping with older adults that it could be prototyping in healthcare with healthcare data or with, in a healthcare setting. That's how I understood it. Um, that yeah, helps. that would, sorry. That would definitely be a very interesting thing to uh, compare and reflect on the differences. Um, if we do exclude some forms of involving participants, um, let's say we never uh, involve participants beyond refining stuff by using prototypes, I would say that it might be a cause for concern, uh, as I at least find it very helpful to work with prototypes and prototyping uh, physically when doing design work. Well, thank you very much for, for explaining that a bit more. Um, I realized the time and I have one kind of final question um, that's come out of the discussion that I'd just like a relatively short answer from, from all of the authors too. I think it'd be quite interesting. Something that's come up in each of your papers, they're all about a method, um, but they're all in a way about noticing things. So we've got kind of noticing the movement in the first paper, noticing the materials, in the second, you know, noticing through reading, noticing through an analysis of the literature. And then we've got even like tools for noticing is how you called it, Anna, I think, um, like noticing through making together and noticing through touch. Um, and just maybe in a very few words, because we don't have a lot of time, um, but just if you could share a couple of thoughts on this idea of noticing and the value that brings to, to the work that you've talked about today. Okay, you can start maybe. Um, well, I see a lot of uh, participatory design uh, literature going on, trying to solve problems and grouping together people to, you know, look at something straight. And I think uh, in my paper, I try to group this these participants to, I don't know, make together and be together to know to notice. Uh, particularities in their lives, their concerns, what they care, uh, what they feel. And I think uh, these moments of being together make us to see things different. And from these, maybe to look at design problems if we want to, but maybe to just understand how to be together as a society. So I think this is something that I notice. Thank you so much. Um, and Harad, I'll go, I'll go next to you, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's been very helpful to notice that people use prototyping very differently and learn from all of these uh, different perspectives. And it's helped me find a lot of uh, areas and projects that I look forward to take on to further develop this understanding and I yeah definitely recommend using these methods to try to help in noticing these patterns. Lab, thank you. Um, and Christina or Flavia or both? It's not such an easy question. <laughs> no. um, I think what what I noticed is the varieties of how to how we are in the world, the varieties of being in the world, how we approach the reality, how diverse we actually are, and that it is very difficult to design a method that fits all, <laughs> and it's not one size fits all. Not a, that's not how it works. I think this is what my main insight, but I also see a potential of using method as research method in participatory design. And I would even say that the stitching approach could be a, a research method. What is actually a matter of concern? Now, as when you mentioned the, the thing where we discuss matters of concern, what are actually the matters of concern? And this we can use participatory design as a research method, I would say. Thank you. And 
Christina, some final thoughts, please, if you have any. <laughs> no, I, I think Flavia just <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> no comments. <laughs> no comments. Fabulous. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, so yeah, like I really like that ending of, of noticing what are the matters of concern, noticing and learning from existing research rather than necessarily going out and doing more and more and more, but actually taking a moment to reflect on what's in the literature and finding patterns there and kind of moving away from only finding solutions, but actually using the design process to notice again, perhaps. Um, so thank you very much again um, to all the presenters. And Paulina, if we could have the, the final slides up again, please. Thank you. Um, just to let people know what's coming up next. Um, so we've got a little break now um, until half past the hour, wherever you are, or I guess some people have half an hour, but at half past three UTC. Um, and after that, we've cut, got two sessions. So at 3.30 UTC, we have two simultaneous sessions um, of exploratory papers, one on build, live and aging spaces, and the other on power activism and commoning, both of which sound absolutely fascinating. Um, and then tomorrow morning, starting early for UTC people, but I guess is late for, for some other people, um, we've got a full papers track on nurturing responsibilities and sustainability. Um, so that's what's happening next. And just before we close, thank you to the speakers. Thank you very much, Paulina, for all the slides. Um, thank you also to the other student volunteers, Rowan and, and Michelle, I hope I'm saying your names right. Thank you very much for all the work. Um, and thanks for all the questions. Um, and hopefully we'll, we can keep these kinds of conversations going. Um, it's been a super, super interesting session. I definitely learned a lot. Um, and hopefully see some of you uh, in other sessions and breaks and things that I'm glad to point. Um, yeah, that's, thank you. End of session. <laughs>